calculated for decades. Could some countries be wealthier than previously understood because of their natural and their social assets? And where will this take business in the 21st century? Hello and welcome to the special CNBC Africa broadcast. I'm Nozi Pombanja. We're coming to you live from Cape Town, South Africa, where the Green Economy Coalition, Green Growth Platform, together with PAGE, are staging a debate to ask the question, what makes your country wealthy? Now, before we get to the debate, some of the critical contextual issues indicate that the conventional measures of progress, be that GDP or corporate profits, tell us only a partial picture of what is happening in an economy or even in a company. Nature and well-being are generally not even visible in GDP or any company's balance sheet for that matter. And as such, our economies can destroy and even ignore these very critical assets. And that is exactly what is happening. And so in this debate, our contending voices will bring unique insights to help us unpack, to help us explore some of the big questions on how best to value our natural and our social capital, how this may impact investment decisions, and whether there are any examples that show that integrating natural capital actually does slow down the loss of nature. So joining me this evening to bring their voices, to bring their insights, to bring their experience into the conversation. Immediately next to me, I'm joined by Cameron Hepburn. He's the executive director of the Smith School at Oxford University. Cameron, welcome. It's lovely to have you this evening. My pleasure. We're also joined by the Honorable Dr. Mary Goretti Kutitu. Uh, Minister, thank you for joining us. She is the Minister of Environment from Uganda. Uh, we appreciate you being here. And next to the Minister is the Secretary General of Amnesty International, that is Mr. Kumi Naidu. Uh, Kumi, it's lovely to have you on stage. And last but not least, we're joined by Nozi Port January Badal, that's Madame. She's a non-executive director on the boards of Anglo Gold, Ashanti, and Mercedes-Benz South Africa. Welcome to all of you and thank you so much for being uh, on the show with us. Cameron, let's just get straight to it. Is economics really the answer here? Because if we think about it, it's the capitalization of everything that a lot of naysayers are saying is directly responsible for the mess that we're in. How do you respond to that? Well, I think the challenge with not pricing and not valuing nature is that it doesn't get factored into decisions. So uh, whether you like it or not, we live and operate in a capitalist economy where people are free to trade. And if you don't put a value on the things that you actually care about, then they're going to be ignored and they're going to be trashed. And that's exactly where we are. So the kind of argument, nature's priceless, we shouldn't price it. it it's got good intentions, but that way lies hell. But just for a second, the camera, if you think about how do we price for pollination? How do we price for the water that forms, falls from the sky? Others argue that at best, we're going to be fighting blind or boxing blind, uh, trying to fit abstract economic concepts and models onto something that is really difficult to measure. So this is difficult. There's no yeah. doubt about that. But, but if you take the power of markets, markets can frequently manage to price things that are difficult mm. to price. So, if you've got some farmers who need the pollination services for their orchards and you've got others keeping bees nearby, and you can design a market such that you will get a, a price of yeah. that sort of service. Or if you take my home country, Australia, yeah. we have a, the world's biggest water market that allocates water between different competing uses across the whole of the Murray-Darling River Basin. So it, it's not easy, but it is possible. And I think we're failing if we don't try. It's not easy, but it is possible. Honorable Minister, let me come to you because I think the question that always comes to government in the context of this conversation is, why does government find it so difficult to say no? Because surely, if you think about a large corporate that has an interest in uh, an investment, whether it be in Uganda or whether it be in Namibia or any part of the continent uh, or the world for that matter, um, one needs to first measure, right, are they coming in with some sort of investment that's going to translate into jobs, that's going to translate into growing the economy, is government putting its foot down and saying, what about natural capital? What about social capital? And does it actually matter beyond your four-year cycle of administration? OK, thank you very much. Uh, I think truly be, uh, speaking, governments, especially in Africa, are, most of our economies are dependent on natural resources. Mm. But when you go to critically look at the way we value them, it is like we apportion no value 
to these natural resources. Mm -hmm. We take them like it is a free good, God given. I can give an example, say like in Uganda, the forestry. Our rainfall, you know, we, we are an economy where 27% of our GDP comes from agriculture. Right. Now our agriculture is rain fed and the rainfall comes from the wetlands and the forests, 40% of it. Now you will find that nobody has ever valued that contribution from wetlands and mm -hmm. forests. So that's why you find that when we are even apportioning the budget, like my ministry, mm. Mm. it is the natural resources, it is what drives the economy. How difficult but is it to sell that idea though? I, here I am, I am an investor. Mm. I have five trillion US dollars that I have promised is going to translate into jobs, but it, it does mean that I need a, a, a hundreds of hectares of your, of your natural asset that I'm going to destroy in the process. What is the conversation that's happening between the government and the investor, given the realization that the economy is dependent on the natural capital base. I think now what we have started doing, like in Uganda, we normally put on the weighing scale, mm. the costs and the benefits. And usually the benefits go with the jobs like you've mentioned. Yeah. And then the costs normally go to the environment side, the damage that you are going to mm. cause. And normally we now allow that project Okay, the benefits pay me more, but you have still have to pay the costs. Yeah. But you find that much as we have to pay those costs, it does not really go to the exact. Mm -hmm. Many times we are struggling because people have failed to understand. Yeah. The moment the project is cleared, then we forget and look more on the benefits and forget. So Cameron's giving me this look that says, I'm dying to say something yeah. very quickly. So, so I'm giving you 10 seconds. In the, <laughs> in the UK, we've just done some numbers. The value of a standing tree is 10 to 15 times larger than the value of that tree cut down and used for timber. And that's the sort of insight that enables you to make a decision. Do we raise this forest to the ground or do we keep it? Because actually providing more value to the economy mm. left standing. So I'll, I'll come to Madame Nozi because I know that when you're making investment decisions, I'm not sure whether you're counting uh, whether you should tear the tree down or whether you should leave it as is and go and invest somewhere else. So let me go to Kumi first before we get there. Kumi, we cannot have this conversation in the absence of the moral conversation that's, that's also taking place. The moral conversation for saving the planet, the moral conversation for protecting uh, people, but a lot of naysayers, again, I keep going back to that saying, it's not working. And if it's not working, should we then go back to Cameron's point and say, well, maybe we need to, uh, we need to look at capitalization. We need to find a way of putting economic value uh, to it because coming at it from a moral point of view is seeing us almost standing stock still in some instances. Well, firstly, let's be very clear. We are not talking here about saving the planet. Mm -hmm. Let me be quite clear. The planet does not need saving. Because if we continue on the suicidal path that we are on, which if you don't listen to what the science says, and the scientists have just told us we have 12 years to get emissions to peak and start coming down, the end result would be our water resources get depleted, our soil gets depleted, we cannot produce food. The end result of catastrophic irreversible climate change is we will be gone, the planet will still be here. And the good news is, once we become extinct as a species, the oceans will recover, the forests will grow back and so on. <laughs> right? So don't worry that the struggle we are engaged, and this is the morality of the struggle. Yeah. Right. The struggle that we engage in is fundamentally about whether humanity can fashion a new way to coexist with nature yeah. in a mutually interdependent relationship for centuries and centuries to come. Put differently, the struggle is nothing more and nothing less than protecting our children and their children's future. Right. And secondly, let me just say on the, on the economic mm. question, and GDP is where we are enslaved by GDP. Okay. Right? GDP, for example, let me just say that there's a book called GDP, the world, uh, Gross Domestic Problem, the world's most powerful <laughs> number, right? Because yeah. in GDP, if you chop down an entire section of the Amazon, that's not a that's not calculated, as our yeah. two speakers have said, right? Yes. So, so we have to be looking for new ways of thinking and yeah. acting. And I would say we must look at places like Bhutan, 
a mm -hmm. small country in South Asia that have a very different way of measuring. They have a thing called gross domestic happiness. Yes. I'm not saying it's perfect, yeah. right? But we need to shift things quite considerably. And I just want to say it is wrong, though, Nosipo, yeah. to accuse, and I'm not saying you did it, but yeah. for civil society to be accused of only focusing on morality and not focusing on economics. Because I can tell you that since the Copenhagen summit, when I was the head of Greenpeace and I was there, yeah. we made the economic connect, uh, connection. We said climate change offers us an opportunity. It's a big crisis, mm -hmm. it threatens humanity's survival, but it does offer us an opportunity, an opportunity to break down the divisions between North and South, East and West, developed and developing, because we have to realize that we get this right as rich and poor countries acting together. Is it working, Kumi? Is no, it working? No, it's not working. It's not working. Yeah. Uh, it's not working because, let's be blunt why it's not working. Okay. Right? The reality is we've got a problem of cognitive dissonance, mm -hmm. basically a denial of reality, Right? I mean, listen, all of us sitting here, even at this conference, right? let me just say, we should be all freaking out by what the scientists told us uh, less than two mm. months ago from, mm. uh, you know, right? We should be like really <coughs> shitting in our pants. I'm sure they'll block that. We'll keep that, that, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so, so what we need is to generate a people's movement, right? Uh -huh. Because part of the problem is us as well in the movements. We talk about these issues in ways that excludes the majority of people. Right? Right. We talk in big jargons and so on, and we need to be And much I'm going to come back to the point of exclusion, because I think that's very important to what you've raised there. But uh, Nozipo, as the voice of business in this particular conversation, I'm sure when you hear people's movements, there's a certain degree of nervousness that, uh, that comes about. And, I'll, and, and, and we'll come back to that. But the question that I want to put to you is, the, the, the accusation that's always at the feet of business is that business is uh, really the one that is benefiting the most from, the natural, uh, from natural capital, irrespective of where you are in the world, more than governments, more than people, but also destroying the natural capital base at the fastest rate. Kumi talks about a 12-year gap that we've been told about by the economists and the scientists. And if there's anyone who's contributing to that gap more than anyone else, that blame would lie at the feet of business. So what now? <laughs> yes, of course. I, I, I mean, I don't feel bad at all about talking about business being the main sort of violator of our, of our natural assets. Um, and it's, it's true. I mean, I, I, I have experience in the mining industry. I can see what mining has done to communities, but I can also see how mining has contributed to the economies, mm. if we are simply looking at it from, a, from an economy. And I'm not going to today, even if I'm speaking, because you've put me into that bracket of speaking for business, is that um, the, 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 some, some business are only beginning to learn, as Kumi was saying, the discourse of even sustainable development. Yeah. It is not a conscious ideological thing that they have in their heads. Uh, so. Most businesses do business to make money. They don't do, do business to save the environment. Right. And so, and, and when they have, they have no, when the limitations are not set, and we ourselves are not working with them, those of us in business, because mm -hmm. my, my, my position in the board situation is that I'm actually an oversight person. So I chair the social eth uh, yeah. ethics and, and sustainability committees, but my experience is that sometimes it's just about ticking boxes. Mm. It's mm. simply about compliance, because the government has said, you know, we're not allowed to violate this environment or that environment mm. in our mining processes. But we haven't really internalized and socialized the issues into the entire institutions that we work in. And so there's a lot of work to be done in there. So what yeah. I'm almost hearing is that this is beyond corporate reporting, because sure. you're saying that those that have been you know, off the mark first in terms of reporting, to some extent are still stuck in the ticking boxes. So yeah. how, do, how do we make natural capital as significant and as important as financial capital and other forms of capital that sit at the very core of strategy in a business um, and, and, and break out of the box of uh, corporate social responsibility, which is another place where yeah. they tend to come and die. Yes, I, I think CSR is used as a mechanism for doing the least mm. in, in a lot of businesses. So what we do, it's largely a top-down thing. It's been put in the budget and the money is being given to communities to shut them up, basically. But at the same time, you know, I've also seen CSI where the approach has been from the bottom up, yeah. where, where the, the, the request for CSI is based on demand rather than supply. Yeah. Where communities, I mean, I, and I, I, I've 
I, I, in Mercedes-Benz, that's exactly what we're doing in, in East London, where the communities are coming and saying, this is what we need, and this is how this company can contribute to our mm. basic needs. And I'm talking really about shelter, yep. I'm talking about food, I'm talking about education, etc. Um, and I think there are one or two or three or four even yeah. that are trying to shift that paradigm from a giving only to shut people up and a real contribution to changing people's and, livelihoods. And, and we'll perhaps get an opportunity to touch on what needs to be true from a business modeling perspective to see sure. that change. If you're joining us from home and you'd like to be a part of this conversation, the hashtag that we're using is what is wealth? Hashtag what is wealth? Let us know some of your thoughts and your questions on Twitter, on any other social media platform, and we'll bring your voice into this conversation. We also have a live audience here with us in Cape Town, and they're going to be leaning into this conversation shortly. But before we do that, Cameron, I want to come back. Beautiful opening um, uh, conversation that we've started with evidence. This is what I'm looking for at this point. Is there any evidence that, or any best practice uh, that says when we begin to value, natural capital, when we begin to put a value and we've got metrics, that it actually does lead to a, a decrease in the loss uh, that we're experiencing. So, so here's an example from the UK, where I live in, in Oxford. Um, the UK put a floor on the price of carbon. So it's mm -hmm. pricing uh, emissions of CO2 so to protect the natural capital of the stable atmosphere. Within five years, the UK's power system had gone from around 50% coal to around 5% coal. Mm -hmm. so it almost completely wiped out coal from the system. That's what happens when you price something properly. Yeah. So it's not a tick box exercise. There's money involved. So the guys who are working out which power stations get to operate, they, they don't operate if they're dirty. Yeah. So it's that sort of big, hard, fat financial incentive that makes a difference to the way business behaves. And I think actually a lot of business want yeah. Yeah. to be hit with those incentives so they can do the right thing. Because incentives and disincentives, I would right, say, both. right? Yeah, 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 both. Well, in fact, this is a disincentive yeah. because you get, you're paying as you put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Mm. So, I, I mean, most chief executives I know want to be forces for good in the world, but they also have to make money for their shareholders. If yeah. the governments can change the playing field so that, that our natural capital is priced, then they can go about making money in a world that also protects uh, the natural environment. It means that we're not kind of degrading our nature base so that we've got this systemic risk yeah. in, in the economy. Who should be leading the, uh, you know, in the interplay between government and, and, and the private sector? And who has the capacity to take the lead? Because I think we oftentimes get bogged down in the conversation of government should, private sector should, and nobody actually says, actually, you've got to take the lead on this and, and everything else will follow from there. It's, it's two way. Yeah. So obviously the, the rules have to be made by a government, but government needs the cover of leading business and leading civil society organizations to say to them, we're backing you on this. You're not going to get chucked out. People are not going to, you know, we'll, we will go, come out behind you and say this is a great policy yeah. to protect, to value, to price your natural capital, to stick it in the accounts. And, and that way they'll, they'll The do Ugandan it. government has taken a lead. Uh, in, in Uganda. So we know we have the natural capital accounting program that's already yeah, starting, yeah. started in Uganda to build that muscle and to build that capability to do exactly that. Very briefly, what's working and what's not working uh, with that program? And if you had the voice of business, and I'll put her back in the bracket that she's, she's, she's working hard to get herself she out. She spent more time in civil society than business for the record. Therefore, you can see her perspective is quite different it's from very most different. people in business. But, but, I, but I, I think for me, that I think that's a great intervention because there, there is business in the live audience. There is business that is tuning in from 48 African countries right now. If you had to address business, given that you've already taken the lead, what is not working and what would you want to see from business? Well, like you said, I think we've taken the lead in valuing the natural resources. And natural, when something begins, of course, there, there is that lag where to be taken on. But I'm going to give an example of the fisheries industry. Now, the fisheries industry, you know, depends on our natural resources, that is the fish. Yeah. And the fish have breeding areas. These are the wetlands. Now, in the 2000 to 2006, the fishing industry was booming. That's when industries came mm -hmm. and people started even exporting fish. But little did they know that we needed to actually value and know where the fish breeds yeah. and also the process of fishing. 
So the, since it was booming, people were fishing in the breeding areas. The, then those who were destroying wetlands were going on. Now, but after this valuation, of course, later on, we warned as an environment authority. I used to be in the authority before. Uh, we warned that what is going on is not sustainable. Yeah. So that was on record. Mm. And it didn't take even two years. The boom was no more. Mm. But as I speak now, the lessons learned, we've now recollected and restarted again. Yeah. And as I speak now, the industries which had closed have opened. But the lessons learned now, we need to know that we shouldn't do certain things. The biggest lesson, the one that exactly. stands out as this so, is the biggest lesson. What so would that this be? should be the lesson. When you do business, it should be sustainable. So part of the profits should be plowed back to sustain, especially for us, the African economies, mm -hmm. which are dependent still on natural resources. We normally forget, I, I mean even at country level, when you look at the way, when we share money at the table, yeah. even the GDP, the, the ministries, like the Ministry of Environment, like I give an example of Uganda, I get 1% of the budget, but most of the GDP is dependent on the environment sector. Right, right. So right. this is why I'm making a very big, big, big mm. point that we need to change things and make sure that we plow back if we have to continue living sustainably so, and business booming as it should. So Cameron, you've got a big job here because at some point you're going to tell us, you have to tell us if not GDP, then what? Um, and, 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 and maybe we'll come to that because we're hearing, well, maybe GDP is not the right way to, to measure wealth in the first place, but also it shouldn't be the way we should be even allocating uh, the national yes. purse in terms of how we make those investments. How much you contributed. And how GDP. much you've contributed to building that economy. Mm -hmm. But what about the people that make the backbone of that? I mean, Kumi, you spoke about exclusion, and I mean, I think that, 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 that touched a chord. How do we ensure that people who depend on the natural environment for their everyday livelihoods are, again, to your point that you, you raised earlier, are not secondary or even tertiary in these conversations and actually really have a voice. And one would assume that is not quite happening at the moment. Well, firstly, the concern is beyond people who are living in forests or living mm -hmm. uh, as indigenous peoples in the Amazon and so on. That's a very important constituency. They are playing a critical role in many places in protecting ecological assets, and we should be supporting indigenous peoples and uh, uh, forest-dwelling peoples and so on. But let me just say the reality of what's happening. According to Global Witness, every week, the equivalent, uh, on average, four environmental activists are killed every single week, right? right? Mainly in Latin America, Asia, and in, in Latin America, so in, in Africa. So with that context, right, that is what we are trying to mobilize against. And, and, and Cameron, you know, when I, I, when I hear you describe it, and I agree with everything that you're saying at one level, at another level, <laughs> I'm saying there's a problem here because we are locked into an existing status mm -hmm. quo that has not worked for humanity. Mm. So I would argue that the biggest disease we face in the world today is not <laughs> HIV, it's not cancer, it's not influenza, but it's a disease you could call affluenza. And affluenza is a pathological illness that the 1% of global society has, right? And by the way, even us attending this conference, go home tonight and go to a website called Global Rich List and put your net salary, and you'll be shocked that if you are in a formal job that you're sitting really right up there, it'll tell you exactly from the seven point so many billion people where you sit, okay? And, and the problem is, we got a pathological problem where people believe that happiness and a decent life comes from more, 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 more material acquisition. That yeah. is the art of the problem. So we have to change that. And I would say that we should remember the words of Martin Luther King when he once said, yeah. I refuse to adjust to an economic conditions that take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the yeah. few when millions of God's children are smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in an affluent society. He said that in the US in 1965. That's a thousand times more applicable to the US and it's applicable throughout the world. So I want to draw attention to the name of 
Green Economy Coalition. When you look at Green Economy Coalition, you must look at what comes below, mm. which is the world's largest movement for free and fair economies. Because basically, we are not talking about a low carbon uh, coalition. Because low carbon would just basically mean decarbonize and just yeah. worry about that. We are concerned about gender equality. We are concerned about workers' rights. We are concerned about creating societies mm. that matter. And so the full name of the coalition, it's a bit cumbersome mm. in a sense, would be an inclusive green economy. Yeah. And that's the problem. You cannot put faith in an economy that serves a fraction of the global population and leaves the majority of us to wait for crisis. I still have a problem, though. I still have a problem, though. Let's, let's hypothetically <laughs> say that we're going to, in this inclusive uh, path that we're going to work, walk together, somebody has to do the valuing. Somebody is going to have to lead the process. Who should that be? I mean, if you th is it is it is it no. auditing firms? I mean, if you think about auditing oh, firms, if yes, you think about auditing idea. firms right now, <laughs> hardly hardly something you know, hardly any vote of confidence from the audience. Who should be doing it? So, firstly, we need to recognise the problem we face is so massive that it would be naive and arrogant of any sector of society, mm. whether it be business, whether it be government, whether it be civil society, whether it be even the faith mm. movement specifically to think that they're going to solve the problem on their own. Right. What we need is a grand super coalition of decent human beings who reside in the different sectors, who are willing to think out of the box, mm -hmm. who are willing to take note of what Albert Einstein once said when he said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting to get different results. Yeah. And let's be blunt about it, that's what we are doing at mm -hmm. the moment. Right? Mm -hmm. Our collective efforts to address the reality of climate change can be captured as rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic while we are sinking. Yeah. So, so therefore, when we think about the economy, who should act and so on, we shouldn't say government or business. No. For one, nobody has the credibility right. individually. The credibility will only come by building a huge people's movement around this yeah. and where all the sectors are in conversation. I, I'm anxious and, and of course, we have to deal with the problem of the madman in Washington, D.C., in the White House, <laughs> who is increasingly holding back all these conversations. Mm. And there are people in governments in, uh, around the world who, because they're so desperate about protecting their economic and trade relationship, they're allowing him to get away mm. with literally murder. Mm. What would need to be true uh, for natural capital to be part and process of the conversation about whether we're going to invest in this market or not? Yeah. Yeah, you know, for me, Nozipo, nothing, nothing is monolithic mm. because we've, Cape Town has just had this amazing experience with drought in the last few years. And, and I think the businesses in this city have felt it. Mm. You know, sometimes you have to experience something to really feel it. Because I think it's not also, uh, we can't put a price on water. Mm. We can't put a price on land. And that's why it's, it's very, because then you're going back to the old uh, um, yeah. way of, of, of dealing with our economics where everything has a price. I think Cape Town experienced the pricelessness of water in the last three or four years. Mm. And, and what that has generated, I think, is a keenness to get the different sectors to actually come together to address it. And I'll, I'll cite one example, which is happening at the University of Salenbosch in their, in their, in their, in their water, water uh, um, uh, department. It's not a department, it's a school. And, and what they've done is they've decided, and it was, inst it was started by an individual, a woman who was interested mm. in the water issue in Cape Town. And she went to Stalinbush and identified the Easter River. The Easter River is a bit like the Vaal. It's the most polluted river, you know, running through. And it's all, all its, its, its tributaries are also highly polluted. And, and they saw how the, the violation of that river they personified the river yeah. and turned it into a live person. Mm. And they asked the School of Art to sort of do a, a, an artistic representation yeah. of this river, where everybody was brought in. And right now what they're doing, the communities who live on both sides of the banks of the river, the businesses that have benefited from that river throughout their life, the yeah. distills of the world, the agricultural, the, the wine farms yeah. that have benefited from the project, from the water of the Easter River, all those people are coming together to clean it up. Mm. And the initiative was one, one human being who was interested and passionate about the issue. Mm. Mm. And I think that's the future for all of us. So that we must not wait for business to start something. If, if, if Kumi and his, his, his institution 
uh, experience the violation of our natural assets. Let them do something and get everybody else involved. And I'm not suggesting by any means that it's easy. Yeah. It is hell of a hard, I can tell you that. Because we haven't got trust, we haven't got the same interests, some yeah. of us just want to make money, others of us are human rights activists, we want to hear the gender discussions in these mm. conversations that we have. But at the end of the day, the experience of the scarcity of water right. that everybody has experienced has, I think, enhanced the value mm that they have of water right now. And I hope I'm correct for those people who live in Cape Town. And that's a real example of, of, of seeing those players come together. Absolutely. I can see your look. Let's take that look, and then I'll go to the audience. Great. So just, I think, it's clear that without water, none of us can live. But it's also clear that we shouldn't be allowed to pollute it without penalty, and we yeah. shouldn't be allowed to take as much of it as we want Absolutely. without paying for it. So you can price an asset without saying the price is equal to the value to all of it. It's a way of resource allocation to make sure that we're not ruining the environment. Mm. I agree. So I, I can imagine that there might be some contentious issues around uh, you know, tariffs and pricing of the, of, 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 of the water, especially in low income or poor communities where their entire livelihood is dependent on that. But let's see if the audience want to, wants to pick up on some of those issues. So there's a question right here. Right here in the front, thank you very much. Sharp and short, uh, please introduce yourself and what's your question? Hello, my name's Mark Goff and I'm from the Natural Capital Coalition collaboration that brings people together on this topic. My questions for the Minister, um, I really commend all the work you're doing. You're one of the leaders on the global stage in this and it's, we need more people like you. But how do we get your colleagues and other departments to understand this in planning mm. and infrastructure and other things? Because you're doing amazing work, but it still feels we've got a long way to go before mm. we get to a tipping point. Thank you very much, Mark. Great question. Uh, the hands uh, behind Mark. Gentleman in the red tie. Yes, please, sir. It would be great if you stood up and then that way um, everybody gets to see you. There we go. Thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm Peter Sullivan. I'm a journalist. I'd, uh, I'd like to ask Kumi and Nozipa I don't know what it costs to calculate GDP, but David Cameron, poor chap, before he left with Brexit, said that it would cost about two billion pounds to calculate a happiness index so that you have at least a base from which you work, so that in five years' time you could see whether a country is happier or not happier. Do you think it's worth spending that kind of money for us to get a base of how happy we are? Yes. Yeah. My question is to Mr. Cameroon. Uh, the market economy that we live today have led to extreme inequalities in terms of social and, uh, and income inequalities. What makes you positive and what, what makes you believe that putting a value to nature would not lead developed countries to consume and be able to pay and extract and exploit resources in developing and underdeveloped countries because they, I mean, you already exist in a very unequal world in Kumbhaya. Thank you. Thank you very much. What's your name, madam? Uh, I'm Anshul from Development Alternatives. Anshul, thank you very much. Uh, th there she is. She's walking towards the front. Can we just give her the microphone? Thank you so much. Hi, good evening, and thank you for a fantastic debate. I'm Karen Cricker from the International Labour Organization. I'm curious that we have models like social enterprise, which kind of sits on the fringes of our economies. Are we actually seeing those models as becoming what the economy of the future actually should be, that all business is, say, a social enterprise? What we're going to do is we're going to, let's, let's take this first batch, and then I'm going to come back to this side of the room so that we don't lose track of the questions that have been asked. So maybe, uh, Cameron, let's start off with you. What gives you the belief and the justification in your beliefs that uh, if we do add a value, it's not going to basically increase inequality between developing and developed co countries? Yeah, so I, I think we've already got a problem of extraction of resources from uh, developing to developed countries. In a sense, those of us in the north are already freely extracting the clean air out of the Amazon uh, you know, every day when we breathe without paying anything for it. Once you start to price natural capital properly, the, the tricky conversation is that the rich world's going to have to start paying for those sorts of ecological services. Now, that is a you know, not straightforward international negotiation. But once you know what you're dealing with, once you've got some numbers and once you can see what the value is, you're less likely to be raping and pillaging developing economies because you're properly pricing the assets. Minister, uh, uh, a vote of confidence uh, from Mark. Great job. But how do you get other departments to do the same? And one would assume, how do you get collaboration between the departments to move at uh, a, a good pace as well? No, thank you very much. Uh, 
the way we are doing it in Uganda, first of all, as a lead ministry, we collect information and which we normally address at the most strategic level, that is cabinet level. So normally at cabinet, you have a chance as a minister to bring a cabinet information paper. Now there you inform colleagues and the lobby in. And normally you target the cabinet which is being chaired by His Excellency so that you put your issues right. Uh, as I speak now, I think the Minister of Finance is now my close ally because he has seen it, because I've demonstrated the importance of us mm. valuing these natural resources, mm. especially in terms of rainfall. Uh, like in 1990, we, the country had about 4.5 million hectares of rainfall, I mean of forests. As we speak now, um, remaining with around 2.3 million hectares, of which 1.5 are government forests. But most of the forests that I lost were on private land. Right. And actually, as the minister himself, his region was the one which was hit most. So water is now scarce. Boreholes have dried. And our water, the groundwater, we've lost 33%. So these are the, this is the information yeah. that I normally put I mean, before. Then when you see the costs, because most times we're normally varying budgets, cutting our budgets to give the disaster side. And I normally say, you see, if we had done this, we shouldn't have yeah. reached this level. So slowly, or oh, as I speak now, I think in Uganda, everybody knows environment should be protected mm. if the economy has to grow. Mm. So it has to be the minister who is, that, that, that's why the environment ministers mm. should be at the center of it to make sure that we bring this. Mm. I've already talked to my colleagues at African Union level Although whenever the presidents meet, it is only the Minister of Finance who are invited and foreign affairs, but I've also complained. Because you can see the marginalization yeah. Yeah. because they think mm, mm. environment is not necessary. But what are going to It's not as important as finance and the yes, economy, right? Yeah, those ones are the ones, mm. the big boys, you know. Then for us, you remain behind. The big boys and big girls. Mm. The big boys and the big girls. <laughs> so, so, Minister, thank you. Uh, 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 thank you for that. But I think, I think the point is clear that it takes a little bit of uh, actively building relationships, building your allies, knowing that if you're not invited into the room, somebody else is carrying the agenda into the room, even if it's the Minister of Finance. So the question from Peter for both yourself, uh, Kumi, and Nozipo was, is it worth putting uh, something like uh, $2 billion uh, to figure out where, how happy we are or not? OK, see, in most of our world, $2 billion is a hell of a lot two, of two money. $2 billion, pounds, I think it was, uh, Peter. OK, yeah? pounds, yes. OK, $2 billion. Pounds. Yeah. Uh, that's probably close to $4 million by these days. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but OK, let's say $4 billion. Mm. It's a lot of money for most of us. But let's just take two comparative figures, right? And I need your help here, Cameron. No, so the amount of money that governments today, collectively in the world, give free subsidies to oil, coal, and gas companies is in the trillions, right? I know that in... One to five. Sorry? One to five trillion. Yeah. One to five trillion. Depending on okay. how you calculate. Yeah, okay, let's just say <laughs> three trillion. Trillion. <laughs> this doesn't right? happen three often, trillion. by the way, so this collaboration. So when we say three trillion versus <laughs> two billion to give us a new framework, it's absolutely... Another comparison is if you take two billion and in the four years that Donald Trump will be in the presidency of the White House, the amount of money he's spending to go to these golf clubs and all of that, in the four years I can guarantee it will far exceed uh, two billion, so I think in that context, it's two billion it. will be well spent. Uh, to be honest with you, I can't even relate to the notion of putting two billion aside for a happiness uh, objective, you know. What I do know is that the Norwegians seem to be, the Nordics, or rather the Nordic countries seem to be doing a relatively better job than most other countries at, at getting this happiness mm. thing right. And maybe it's because what they are doing, and I mean, I know more about the Norwegian uh, wealth fund because what they are at least doing is taking their oil money and putting it aside for the future of their, of their society. So, so when, when these uh, surveys are done about happiness in the world, they normally are at the top end of the scale. Mm. You know, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland, and all those kinds of places 
and then you get places like Switzerland where they don't have minerals, they, don't, they only have water, and of course, I mean, they, I'm, I'm, I'm not, the, the, the Swiss have been very clever at making a lot of money for themselves, but I do know that they value their water because that's all they have really. Yeah. So, uh, and, and, and they value their, their country because they put most of the money they make for the benefit of, of their people. Um, so, 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 so I think that, you know, this, this is a very complex thing and we mustn't uh, kind of simplify it. Mm. But, uh, but I do think that by citing the examples, yeah. we perhaps find the answers there and we are a long mm. way from there. Most mm. of our countries are a long way from there. Uh, because we haven't been there long enough. I mean, with us in South Africa, it's been 24 years. Yeah. But we've also seen how corruption has really mm. dug into our own, our own, uh, our own social uh, development. Mm. Um, so I know, I know Cameron wants to contribute again, but Karen, just a very quick one at the back. To whom did you pose the social enterprise question? Anyone. So it's going to come to you, Cameron, oh. to pay for your sins for wanting to say something again. <laughs> All right? So let's, let's get your comment. Uh, on this ongoing conversation, yep. and then let's bring in the comment on social enterprises. Great. So the first comment is there's absolutely no way it costs two billion quid uh, to estimate happiness. I think you might have got a th three zeros uh, added on there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the second thing is that the, these accounting processes done within governments or within the UN or within the World Bank, they don't cost a lot, but they have enormous power. So GDP, everybody's focused on it because it's a standard measure that everybody calculates. You know, it's nuts. It's a good measure of economic activity because after the Great Depression, Keynes realized that it was useful. But it wasn't ever that way. It's not inevitable. It doesn't have to be that way in the future. And we at least need to complement it with a stock-based measure of what we've got. What are our assets? What's our natural assets? What are our human assets and social assets? And it does not cost much to do the numbers, but it's very revealing when you do do the numbers. So that, that's the point I really want to make. Social, Social enterprises, enterprise. um, can they help? Mm. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, can I just add to that? That I, that I think that the current system is not delivering what humanity no. needs. Let's accept that. We need to be looking at innovating and innovation on a scale that we've never seen before. Yeah. I think social enterprise, social entrepreneurship, including collectives, right? Economic collectives and cooperatives. I, with a few Old comrades of mine are involved in one such initiative in the Eastern Free State that's delivering results in a rural area and so on. Where mm. so, so when I talk innovation, can I just say, I've, and, and, if, and if I can take you back to your first question about is civil society making the connection with economics? Yeah. Right? So for the last couple of years, I've been saying to African leaders right, on, at the AU level and so on, I've been saying, listen, we know that Uppsala in Sweden and Bristol in England now run their buses, right, on human feces, mm. yeah. okay, otherwise known as just shit, right, right. <laughs> so, so basically, I was a visiting professor at Uppsala when I heard about this. I went, I followed the buses, I <laughs> smelled art, no smell, nothing, right. So I've been saying to our leaders, if Europeans can run their buses on shit, mm. I refuse to accept that European shit is superior to African shit. <laughs> we have to get our shit together. We have, no, seriously, we have to get our shit together yeah. and turn the crisis of climate change into a serious economic opportunity yeah. that really <laughs> delivers to the poorest of the poor because the current economic system does not serve the environment, neither does it serve so, the poor. I'm, I'm trying so hard Sorry, to, to finish this with a straight face. Okay, I'm going to take the question right here in the front. Uh, go ahead and please introduce yourself. So thank you. I'm coming from the happiness zone of Nordic countries. I'm a minister for environment, energy, and housing, Finland, the happiest country in the world. <laughs> so <laughs> what, what can make countries wealth or rich or happy? I would say that, of course, democracy, human rights, mm -hmm. and reliable public administration without corruption. And coming from Finland, mm -hmm. I would also add that, of course, sustainable use of natural resources has made us rich. Mm -hmm. but even about that, I would raise equality of education. Mm. When I was born, it was just two years before that when that small countryside village had access to electricity and constant road connection. But what I was very lucky, I was privileged to go to school where the level of education was exactly the same than in the towns and cities in Finland. Mm. And it opened for me, opportunities to go forward. Uh, and I would like to ask you, how do you see the role of education yeah. when we are discussing about the inclusive green economy? 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Your Excellency. So let's have, let's have a gentleman who's been jumping out of his seats. Yes, that's you. Please go ahead. And then we'll take one more. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. My name is Steve Arowolo. Um, I represent Green Shift Africa. Um, yeah, I just want to actually bring attention to what is actually current, currently trending, I think globally and especially in South Africa, as we sit here to discuss uh, about green growth and the green economy. There's a, a statistic that just came out now saying that actually globally, South Africa is having the highest uh, percentage of youth unemployment. Mm. And, and that to me is very scary. Uh, it's a ticking time bomb. And the, the, the question I think we should be interrogating is how do we, how do we what are we going to do? There's, I see that there's a disconnect between the natural capital and the human capital. How do we begin to reason along the line of trying to leverage the opportunities that we have in natural capital yeah. to actually you know, assist some of this problem? So that, to me, I think should be the, the, the way we, we try to look at this thing. And also, we talk about inclusive economy. And yeah. I like the way Kumi puts it. But if you look at it, we, even from the panel setup, I, I can see that things are not inclusive because no youth, no youth is represented here. And we are talking about the future. <laughs> Thank you. Steve, I'm offended, but that's fine. <laughs> The youth is moderating. <laughs> uh, youth is moderating the conversation. All right, I really want a young person. So, but Steve, great question. Good can question. I, if you are part of the students, can you stand up and ask a question? There we go. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Akona Kojeni, and I represent the youth at SIA. I'm from Stellenbosch University. Um, we have a question which asks, climate change was foreseen years ago, but we still have people not understanding the importance of sustainable living and recycling. So the question is, how are we going to prevent the fourth industrial revolution from becoming another threat like climate change in the world? Thank you, Akona. So let's, let's, let's get back to the panel. Thank you, Akona. Great, great question. Um, the role of education in the conversation that we're having, the role of education towards an inclusive green economy, if you will. Um, let me get your, your, your thoughts on it, Cameron. I see you nodding, and Kumi, maybe let's get you, and then we'll spread out the rest of the questions. Your know, education is key because uh, of the total capitals, if you look at many countries, um, human capital, which is how well we're educated, is the biggest bit. Uh, and you know, a key factor in the UK, the last budget, the ONS, the Office of National Statistics and the Treasury, are actually finally going to properly measure human capital so that we can work out whether it's declining or whether we need to put more into education and training. The other reason it's critical, and Kumi could probably speak this better than I can, is that it's your education teaches you not, not just the facts and the knowledge about the science of these environmental problems, but also the values uh, and, and the attitudes that then shape behavior over the subsequent 10, 20 years. And so it's an absolutely central part mm. of the challenge. But I think the key question is what kind of education yeah. and at what level, right? Because, uh, you know, let's be blunt about it. If we look at our university system, how many universities you go to and you'll see a logo of a renewable energy company that has had the capability to buy one old building and call it the Shell Building for Energy Excellence or whatever, right? So basically, governments give huge subsidies to fossil fuel companies. Some of that money from their profits they put into they basically buy universities, right? Mm. So, so we need to address education. We need to invest in education, but we need to understand that to do it well would require some rethinking about how the education process actually plays yeah. itself out in practice. Yeah, right. So, and, and, and I think this touches both on the minister as well as, um, as Steve's uh, contribution around uh, natural and human capital. Uh, Minister, I, I, I want to come to the question that Akona was raised, which I think is quite important. She says, well, uh, we've been talking about climate change for a very, very long time. The conversation, to some extent, has moved uh, to the fourth industrial revolution. This is the new buzzword or the new sexy term that we're using. So how do we make sure that the fourth industrial revolution, to use her words, doesn't become a threat? I think I was the minister who led the delegation of Uganda to Poland in the negotiations. Mm. And I also, I think, followed the negotiations very well. But I think what was disappointing was, much as, like he has said, the report from IPCC is very worrying. 
but when we were there, you could still find that. Of course, for us from the least developed countries, we're negotiating from, we had the Africa block, you have the LDCs, we had the rainforest, we have various groups all negotiating. And then, of course, the, 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 the powers, the developed countries, also in another block. Now, what I observed very, very keenly is, you see, we're all trying to see how do we get the threshold. For us as least developed countries, like for Uganda, I don't have any emissions. Actually, our emissions are at 0.01%. Mm, right. I'm not worried about that. But I'm more worried about how I'm being impacted. Yeah. And then I have to mitigate incur costs for sins which I didn't commit. Mm. But you find that in the house, you find the negotiators, others will tell us, but you also uh, economies, you have natural capital. Why can't you use that to mitigate? So yeah. you find that still people are not yet, although we know that we have a problem, mm. people mm. are not ready, eh? they are not transparent to say we need to cut these emissions. Right. And then also what I saw was the green climate financing. Putting money, for those who are doing bad things, we said put money here for us to clean. Like for me, yeah. I now have my forests, yeah. which I'm using to clean the air free of charge. Why can't I be paid for those forests that I'm keeping mm. in mm. Uganda? Mm. So these are the negotiations that were going on. But you find that much as they pledged to put 100 billion in that, we just only have 10 right. billion. So you find that we, so you've we got are not the pledges, yet. you've got the pleasures, but the action and the actually action putting actually. the, is the thing that lags behind. Yeah. In Marrakesh, we said, we now reduce our negotiations, we go on actions. Yeah. In Ibon, we said now, actions should go to the grassroots. Mm, mm. Now in Poland, we're now just recycling. Right. So you find that we are just rotating around, but the problem is still with us. Right. And I must say, we still have a problem of climate change. Mm. Because even after Poland, I don't think yeah. I can be convinced that we came out with the really so, so, something so, so I can say. So the conversation actually hasn't, uh, hasn't moved on. In fact, the conversation has become compounded. And, and, and maybe as a final comment on this, mm -hmm. I think it would be great to get your views because I think we cannot actually separate what's happening in the environment, the rate of technological change that mm -hmm. is happening, um, the impact that that's having on the need and the kind of demand and supply patterns uh, of, of human capital that we have to see. If you were to bring your voice into this, this, this conversation that Akona has started um, about climate change, technolo technological change, where do you, these two meet each other? Well, you know, I, again, uh, what I'd like to do is perhaps share a couple of examples, sure. because I think the stories sometimes tell the story uh, of what's happened. I think the, certainly the companies that I'm involved in are experimenting on some of these things, and to the extent to which they're successful, I think, may be measured in the long term. So, for example, in Mercedes-Benz, we have this wonderful production place, you know, in, in East London, where they have tried to do a, what they call a paperless production process right. to deal with the very thing about cutting trees that we started off at the beginning when Cameron made his comment about cutting the trees. So what, you, what they've done is, so there's this completely paperless production process that has also been influenced by advanced, more advanced technology, where everything is done through very complicated hardware, but also sort of data movement within the plant. Right. But that has led to job, people, people not having jobs, because the, you know, the robots are taking over the production of all these C-class Mercedes-Benz that are being shipped off every other day. Now, you can measure, you can say that's, that's a good step, because it's saving the trees on the one hand, but it has been at the cost of, 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 of jobs. And, and how, do we, how do we manage that, from a, certainly from an oversight perspective? In the mining industry, on the other hand, um, there is this whole thing about how do we share natural assets, natural God-given assets, yeah. like our gold, you know, with those Zamazama guys, yes. the, and as well as the artisanal miners, who have always mined for as long as I can remember. Yeah. And some of the solutions, some of the conversations that are being had is let the, some concessions be given 
to people so that they can continue to mine artisanally, but those things require lots of et cetera. So there are a little bit of, of interventions that are happening yeah. that have to happen to try and, mm. you know, to try and redirect the very problem that we started talking mm. about. But I think it's going to take a long, long, long time because mindsets are not moving fast. So at the core of this conversation, what keeps uh, coming back as a central theme is that there is a mindset uh, shift that is required. It's almost about building new neural pathways in the way we think and the way we approach problems. And so as a way of closing this conversation, we're gonna put, a, we're gonna put our panelists a little bit to the test. They've been very vocal. They've used some bad language uh, in, in some of their comments. So I think they maybe deserve this final closing challenge. So, as a closing challenge, um, you're going to give us a statement that is going to be the headlines for the newspapers tomorrow. And the statement is a response to the question, and you're going to start off by saying, what makes my country wealthy is, and you're going to complete that sentence. And hopefully that headline is uh, optimistic, it's futuristic, and it gives us a sense of what is possible on the back of this conversation. Kumi is giving me this look that he's going to absolutely murder me after this. <laughs> so <laughs> so I'm, this I'm doing it for my media friends in the room who are in desperate need of the headlines tomorrow. So Cameron, we're going to start with you. You interrupted the most. So. What makes my country wealthy is. So you'll start off and you'll complete the sentence. Well, I'm going to take my lead from Kumi and give the guys on the bleep machine a bit of extra work to do. But what makes my country wealthy is that we've got our natural and our educational shit together. <laughs> <laughs> Minister, what makes my country wealthy? And if, if you can start with that sentence. Yeah, what makes my country rich is the rich agricultural soils and a favorable climate. The rich agricultural soils and the favorable climate. Lovely, thank you. Kumi. What makes my country rich is a genuine respect for human rights, for gender equality, and a genuine respect for protecting our environment for current and future generations. Nozipo, you have the final <laughs> say. This is now Sunday papers. So, you know, you know, Sunday papers are the paper headlines. So let's go for it. <laughs> now, what makes my country rich is really the people. I think mm. the people are going to get South Africa back on its tracks what because they have a lot of resilience. They know exactly what to do. They just need to go out and do mm. it. I think we, the people of this country, are its best asset. Mm. And you know, I, I really have a strong belief that we will do it like we've done it. We, we got rid of apartheid, yeah. the people. And, you know, and they're going to get rid of whatever else is holding us back from advancing our societies. Well, on that note, what makes my country wealthy is my people. That's a powerful way of ending this conversation. It's a very, very big thank you to all my guests who've made time to join me today. Very big thank you to Cameron, to the Honorable Minister, to Kumi, to Nozipo. From myself, Nozipo Mbanjwa for CNBC Africa, it's good night. <laughs>